It's time again for Northwestern Outdoors Radio, the show covering fishing, hunting, and all sorts of outdoor recreation and destinations right here in the region you live and play in. Northwestern Outdoors is brought to you every week by Max Lure Company, makers of the world-famous wedding ring spinner, by Loophole, America's optics authority, and by Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter. Northwestern Outdoors is also sponsored by Wallawa County in Northeast Oregon, where you'll find both nature and fun. By Chad's Coast White Sports Fishing, offering you the affordable Canadian fishing trip of a lifetime. And by Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors. So grab your fishing rod or hunting gear, load up the boat or lace up your boots, and let's head outdoors with your host, John Cruz. It was a long winter, and now it's been a very interesting spring. It's been cool west of the Continental Divide, but on the bright side, there is plenty of snow that remains in the mountains and lots of water, not only for farmers and orchardists, but also for river rafters and kayakers. In fact, I expect this is going to be a banner year for whitewater enthusiasts that because of our heavy snowfall this past winter should last much longer than usual. If you're looking for some places to go rafting with no experience required, here's a few suggestions. Arguably, the two most popular rivers to go rafting in the Northwest, at least on day trips, are the Wenatchee River between Leavenworth and Kashmir in north central Washington and the Deschutes River near Maupin. Both really popular and really fun if you're looking for some Class 3 whitewater action. If you are a little more daring, consider a trip down the White Salmon River in Klickitat County or the Locksaw River in north central Idaho. The Snake and Salmon Rivers as well as the Rogue Rivers are all fantastic multi-day getaway opportunities. And if you want something a little less on the wavy side but offering plenty of views and wildlife, consider the Ho, the Skagit, or Medhow Rivers in Washington, the Grand Ron bordering Oregon and Washington, the Snake River flowing through Grand Teton National Park, or Montana's Big Missouri River. No matter which adventure you choose, you are sure to enjoy it, whether you go now or later this summer. This week on the show, we've got a bunch of fishing coming your way. We'll start off with Eric Winther with the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. He's got the latest fishing report for us from the Columbia and Snake Rivers, and he's also got some advice on how to catch these fish this summer. Speaking of river fisheries, they are opening up catch and keep sturgeon fishing on portions of the upper Columbia River, as well as on Lake Roosevelt. There's been talk of doing the same on the lower Columbia, but the Coastal Conservation Association has asked the fisheries commissions to slow down before establishing a season. Nella Pasinich, the executive director of CCA Washington, will tell you about that. Heading to Big Sky Country, we'll get a chance to talk to Mike Howe with A. Abel Fishing Charters. He'll give you the latest about the lake trout fishery at Western Montana's Flathead Lake, and then tempt you to go fishing with his guides out of northeast montana's fort peck reservoir for of all things chinook salmon lance murs is back with a great contraption for your downrigger on this week's max minute and we've got some upcoming events to tell you about taking place at sportsman's warehouse stores near you but first it's time for this week's edition of Sportsman Spotlight with David Sparks. Sportsman Spotlight is brought to you every week by Chad's Coastwide Sports Fishing, offering affordable, all-inclusive saltwater fishing vacations for salmon, halibut, and more out of Port Hardy, B.C. Find out more at coastwidesportsfishing.com. A place you don't often, but ought to, think about. David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight. You know, I'm really spoiled living here in the great Northwest, what with all of the hunting and fishing opportunities that exist. Crazy good elk hunting, muley hunting, trout and steelhead fishing, whitetail, turkey, you name it, we probably have it. Now, all of that said, let's talk about highs and low country. Senior Deputy Editor Colin Kearns from Field and Stream discusses chasing hogs, fanning gobblers, kayak fishing, trapping crabs, camping under the stars. All of this beautiful Beautiful activity occurring in a place that was not obvious to me. South Carolina's low country is a wild wonderland where outdoorsmen can have the ultimate spring break. 
This might have been my favorite story in the issue. And what we did for this one, one of our best writers, Eddie Nickens, went down to the Low Country, which is this region in South Carolina. And it's an area that not too many people have heard of. And what it is, it's just this wild wonderland. There's no houses, kind of have this place all to yourself. And there's all sorts of fun stuff there for outdoorsmen can do. And in this story, the writer and his son went hog hunting, they went turkey hunting, and then they kayaked around these barrier islands and fished and clammed, you know, had a lot of fun then and, you know, had this epic campfire feast on the beach for their last night. It's kind of one of those grand slam adventures. You can do all sorts of things on one trip. And if that doesn't get you excited for spring to read about a good adventure, I don't know what will. Point made, point taken. This is David Sparks for Sportsman's Spotlight. A quality and affordable fishing adventure is waiting for you off Vancouver Island with Chad's Coastwide Sports Fishing. Located in Port Hardy, British Columbia, you can drive or fly to your all-inclusive guided fishing vacation. Whether you're after big salmon, hard-fighting halibut, or a cooler full of red snapper and ling cod, you can catch it all here. Better yet, your lodging, meals, and fish processing are all taken care of. Want one more reason to go? The price. With the Canadian dollar exchange rate where it is right now, your U.S. dollar goes further. Space is limited, so go to CoastwideSportsFishing.com to book your trip. That's Coastwide Sports fishing.com for an incredible bc fishing adventure at loophole optics they guarantee performance those other optics companies they just warranty failure that's why every loophole product has a lifetime guarantee think of it as a warranty you'll never need to cash in on find out more at loophole.com you can fish from a boat or you can stand on shore or you can use a pontoon with carpet on the floor you can sit upon a dock or wait out to a Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. We are going to take you to the Columbia and Snake Rivers. As you know, the, the salmon fishery has been interesting, to say the least, this year. But we were wondering how the pike minnow fishery was going. Why do you ask? Well, because there's a sport reward fishery for northern pike minnow in portions of the Columbia and Snake River. With us here to give us a fishery report to tell you more is Eric Winther with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Eric, welcome back to the show. Hi, John. Glad to be here. So for our listeners that don't know about the Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program, give the quick 30-second elevator speech so they know all about it. Okay. Well, the Pike Minnow Program is on the Columbia River main stem from the mouth all the way up to Priest Rapids Dam, also on the Snake River from the mouth all the way up to Hell's Canyon Dam. And the nuts and bolts of it is that we pay anglers to catch northern pike minnow that are nine inches or bigger between May and the end of September. Uh, You can earn five bucks a piece. It's a sliding scale, so the more you catch, the more you make get over 25 of them, it goes up to $6 a piece. And if you get over 200, it goes up to uh, $8 a piece. So here's a question for you, Eric. For those people who don't live next to the the way stations or the check stations where you, you go in and basically register for the day or register for your fishing trip, and then you come back and give them your fish. Uh, for example, I was fishing on the Upper Columbia near Daroga Park, caught a couple of pike minnow. It wouldn't have made a lot of economic sense, but if I had caught in a bunch – could I have driven down towards Priest Rapids and Vernita to the check station there and turned those in, or those out of bounds, so to speak? Yeah, those, those would be out of bound fish. Uh, the boundaries of the program just go up to Priest Rapids Dam, and so catching fish from outside that area is kind of outside the scope of our program. A lot, a lot of times the PUDs up there do their own little uh, pike minnow derbies or whatever, but to get paid the reward, you got to be lower down on the river, definitely. And one other thing, folks. If you're wondering about how much money can be made, let me put it this way. There was an angler last year that made close to $120,000 fishing from May to September in the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. So there's serious cash to be made here. So with that in mind, let's talk about the latest Pike Minnow Fishing Report, which I think is going to be interesting because we've had abnormally high water levels and flows and cool temperatures this year. Is that affecting the pike minnow fishery? Definitely, John. Just like you were saying with the uh, the salmon fishery, it makes things a little interesting. In um, high water years, generally speaking, our, our catches, overall catches, are, are lower. Uh, we've got a couple of bright spots, though, this year. I mean, if you look throughout the, the program last week, we averaged about five fish per angler per day. But there's some pretty good catches happening in a couple of locations. Over your way, the, uh, the mouth of the uh, Yakima there in the Tri-Cities, that's been a pretty darn good fishery and the uh the dows of course which was our number one station last year 
uh, has been pretty strong as well. So if you're really looking to catch fish, even in the high water, those would be the places to go. Now, when it comes to the Dells in particular, a lot of those anglers, I know that most anglers fish from the boat, but a lot of the anglers that are turning fish into the Dalles weight station, they're fishing from the bank. Exactly where are they fishing there? Well, there's some decent access on the Washington side of the river. Um, there's a, a bridge right below the dam, and the river kind of takes a big bend. And throughout that uh, stretch, there's some decent bank angling uh, opportunity. Also, if you get down a little bit further close to the mouth of the Klickitat River, uh, there's a couple spots down there where you can get some fish from shore, too. But but you are right. It's primarily uh, boat fishery, and most of the guys that are getting real good numbers, those are uh, boat anglers. So, Eric, as we move into June, as we move into July, and, and things kind of temper out as far as the river goes and the flows, where do you expect the hot spots to be? Is it going to continue to be the Dalles and off the mouth of the Yakima, or is it going to move to some other locations? Well, things do uh, typically shift a little bit as we go through the season. Historically, our peak catch is usually around the last week of June. The high water, it's probably going to be a week or two later this year, so it'll probably push it into into July. Uh, the Dalles, for example, we mentioned earlier, it, it starts off really good fishing, and it'll last through maybe middle of July, possibly this year to the end of July, and then it really kind of tapers off. Some other locations that haven't really turned on yet are, uh, for example, up on the Snake River at Boyer Park. Uh, that was our number two station last year, and either Boyer Park or the Dallas have been our top two stations every year for the last 10, 12 years. That one really, once this water passes through, that one starts to come on strong and will build and just get better as we go between now and the end of the fishery in September. You're listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We're talking to Eric Winther with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and with the Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. Your chance to catch northern pike minnow in portions of the Columbia and Snake Rivers and turn them in for vouchers that will give you cash. Serious cash, too. So let's talk about catching these little fish, and some of them are not so little, by the way. What are the the best tried-and-true methods at this time of year to catch pike minnow out of these two rivers? Well, most most uh, successful pike min- minnow anglers are, are bait fishing. Probably the most popular bait is uh, fresh chicken liver that you'd buy it at any uh, grocery store. It's kind of a soft bait. It's a little bit hard to, to keep on the hook, but uh, with a good egg loop and a couple loops, uh, that really helps. As we as we get a little more into salmon season, there will also be the availability of what we call salmon guts. And what I mean by that is the heart, the liver, the bloodline of uh, salmon or steelhead, those also make excellent uh, pike minnow bait. And then another thing that, uh, especially in, in uh, eastern Washington, uh, that will pick up here is what's called Mormon crickets. And those are out out and about where anglers uh, catch them. Uh, one of the places out is out in the Juniper Dunes by the Tri-Cities. And those things are kind of small now, but they're, they're growing like crazy, and they ultimately get about two inches long. Those are just a dynamite uh, pike minnow bait if you can get them. You're, you're either fishing off a dropper out the back of your boat or, or kind of plunking from shore. You probably want that bait a little bit off the bottom, maybe maybe four inches or so, like on a dropper. Um, I like to have a bait that's, that's close to the bottom, but it's kind of up off the bottom a little bit, so it kind of moves uh, in the current. And then you're looking for likely pike minnow ambush areas. Typically, it's going to be a current seam or some kind of structure, some boulders, uh, some pilings, something like that, where where a pike minnow can lay in there and ambush uh, the smolts that are coming down uh, this time of year. Well, there you go. And, folks, uh, from personal experience, I can tell you night crawlers work, too. Probably not as well as what Eric's recommending, but <laughs> night crawlers work, too. We're running out of time, Eric. But before we go, let's steer people to the website where they can find out more about participating in the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program and bringing home some summer cash. Um, yeah, we have a lot of Pike Minnow information on the uh, Pike Minnow website, which is Pike Minnow one word dot org 
And another one that we're kind of getting developed is the uh, Pike Minnow Facebook page, too. We're trying to get some uh, good content on that as well. Uh, both of those are good sources. We have the weekly catch totals, uh, so you can get an idea if the fishing's really picking up, and some how-to and, and all sorts of uh, goodies for prospective Pike Minnow anglers. It's pikeminnow.org. Pikeminnow.org is the website to go to to check out everything you need to know about participating in the Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. And the next time you go fishing, just tell your wife, your girlfriend, your loved one, I'm not going fishing. I'm going to make us some money. Eric, thanks for sharing this with us on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. No problem, John. Good talking with you. Bass Lake, Otter Lake, Goose Lake, Gull Lake, Round Lake, Pearl Lake, Rice Lake, Sugar Lake, Mud Lake, Long Lake, Ant Lake, Swan Lake, and Lake of the Woods. Oh, I fish everywhere. Want to go fishing and make money? You are in luck. This year's Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery kicks off May 1st. Just register at a check station and go fishing for 9-inch or longer northern pike minnow within designated waters of the Columbia or Snake River. Then you bring your fish back and collect a voucher good for a cash reward. The more fish you catch, the more they're worth. Five, six, and eight dollars per fish. Catch a pike minnow with a special tag and you've landed 500 bucks. Find out more at pikeminnow.org. That's pikeminnow.org. It doesn't matter what sort of adventure you're after. Whether it's big game deep in the backcountry, a day of fishing out on the water, or an overnight in the great outdoors. At Sportsman's Warehouse, we've got the gear in here for what you need out there. Gear up for your next adventure at one of the Sportsman's Warehouse stores or shop online. Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter. You're back with more of The Great Outdoors on Northwestern Outdoors Radio with John Cruz. It's that time again. That's right. It's time for another Max Minute brought to you every week by Max Lure Company. With us as always, Lance Murs. Lance, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, John. Thanks. Lance, I know you have got some downriggers on your boats. I know a lot of our listeners have downriggers on their boats. And I understand Max Lure Company has a brand new accessory for all of those downrigger owners. Well, I do, John. You know, I've got four downriggers on my boat, and I do not like to stack. But... We've got a new product out, and it was formerly Shasta Tackle. It's called the Shuttlehawk. It's a downrigger stacking system that allows you to keep more lines on one downrigger cable in the water without having to raise up that entire cable and lose all those rods in the water. I've never heard of such a thing. Go ahead and tell us more. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. You let your first line out, you drop it down. You've got a stop on your downrigger cable itself. And you let your line out like normal, and then you attach the shuttle hawk to the downrigger cable, and it's got an ultra release on there. You clip in that ultra release into your line, and what that does is that shuttle hawk will actually dive down to that stop. Now, if a fish gets on it, the fish will pop off of the clip, and that shuttle hawk will race to the surface and keep that first line in the water fascinating stuff. So for folks who only have one or two downriggers, they can basically double their offering. Absolutely. You can run multiple lines off of one downrigger. Now, the other cool thing to do is if you buy the Shuttlehawk, it's got a little QR code on the back that shows you an instructional video of how to do it. It's confusing at first, but once you get it down, this will be a tool that you want to have on your boat every time. All right, it's the Shuttlehawk, folks. It's from Max Lure Company, and if you own a downrigger, you'll want to check this out. Look for it at your local sporting goods store or at maxlure.com. The Sling Blade is Max Lure Company's latest dodger for you to use. Lance Burrs is with us from Max Lure Company to tell you more about it. Why are you so excited about the Sling Blade? Versatility, John. You can bend the Sling Blade and change it from a reactionary bite to a normal bite, and it's got so many possibilities. Not only that, it comes in different sizes. You can use the Sling Blade for everything from trout and kokanee all the way to ocean-going salmon. It's the Sling Blade. Look for it at maxlure.com. 
The Quality and Affordable Fishing Adventure is waiting for you off Vancouver Island with Chad's Coast Wide Sports Fishing. Located in Port Hardy, British Columbia, you can drive or fly to your all inclusive guided fishing vacation. Whether you're after big salmon, hard fighting halibut, or a cooler full of red snapper and ling cod, you can catch it all here. Better yet, your lodging, meals, and fish processing are all taken care of. Want one more reason to go? The price. With the Canadian dollar exchange rate where it is right now, your U.S. dollar goes further. Space is limited, so go to coastwidesportsfishing.com to book your trip. That's Coastwide Sports fishing.com for an incredible bc fishing adventure planning to head outdoors today the national shooting sports foundation reminds you to check the fire danger levels in your area whether target shooting camping or even parking a car with a hot exhaust remember to take precautions as we know wildfires have many possible causes don't be one of them i'm gonna take you fishing honey you're gonna love it Get up before the sun. Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz, and we are taking you to the great state of Montana. Why are we taking you to Big Sky Country? Because you need to go fishing there, specifically in Flathead Lake. And the man that knows all about fishing for the big lake trout there is Mike Howe. He is the owner of House Fishing and A. Able Charters. Mike, great to have you back on the show. John, it's, it's great to be back with you. Greetings from the great state of Montana. So, Mike, Flathead Lake, big lake that encompasses the, the small towns of Polson, Big Fork, Lakeside. How's the fishing been there this spring? Well, the fishing is uh, is finally getting started. We've had a we've had a slow start, John. It's been a, you know a, a very prolonged early spring. Uh, everything being kind of slow to warm up. You know, this is the time of year these fish start concentrating on the north end of the lake, which is exactly where we focus our efforts. So uh, we're anticipating a great spring and an even better summer. So yeah, folks need to make their reservations and come up and go fishing with us. For folks who are not familiar with the lake trout fishery at Flathead Lake, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about it in terms of how prolific the fish are, how big they get, and how you target them in terms of fishing? Yeah, you bet. Well, lake trout were introduced in the Flathead Lake in 1905, along with Lake Superior whitefish and yellow perch. And we had a multi-species fishery on Flathead Lake until the mid-90s when the uh, mice shrimp uh, kind of infiltrated from some upstream lakes and really changed the entire food web. So in the last 15 to 20 years, Flathead Lake has really become a, a lake trout exclusive fishery. And uh, in this particular lake, very deep water. 370 feet maximum depth and 165 feet average depth. So we target these lake trout with downriggers. Right about now, the next month or so, a lot of these fish will be up shallow, feeding uh, on the on the food that all the food that the Flathead River brings in. So we're actually catching them on the surface with crankbaits as well as uh, those deeper depths, which is a lot of fun. A uh, 18 to 20 pound laker on a surface line with a crankbait is. Uh, you might as well be reeling in a king salmon. It really, really is a completely different type of catch. We have a lot of fish in that mid-range, 24 to 28 inches, which are our best eating fish. Great red meat due to that mysa shrimp diet. Um, but we have been stockpiling larger fish since about 2002 when we put the 30 to 36 inch must release slot limit. So for the last 15 years, we've been releasing a lot of those 30, 32, 34 inch fish. So the trophy potential is there, even though these fish have a great forage base and uh, they're certainly not hurting for their next meal, uh, we still manage to catch these fish quite regularly. Those that want to target the biggest fish, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to look for those fish in the 20 pound and up range. Those that want good action and some good eating fish to take, then we'll target those 24 to 26 inch, four to six pound fish. Well, I'll tell you what, Mike, either day sounds like a great day to me. And folks, uh, there's few finer places to spend a day fishing the Flathead Lake. Gorgeous scenery, and, and that kind of encompasses all of western Montana as far as I'm concerned. Let's talk about some, well, not so breaking news for you, but breaking news for the rest of us. You bought out another guide service. I understand you've expanded your capabilities when it comes to offering more charter services. 
We have, John. Uh, you know, some unfortunate circumstances over the winter uh, led us to kind of uh, be able to purchase arguably the, the biggest outfitter on the lake, A. Abel, and now Mofish Charters, have pretty much been neck and neck over the last three or four years doing in the 350 charter trips a year range on Flathead Lake. Uh, so we purchased and have assumed operations of Mofish Charters out of Lakeside. So now we're running A. Abel Charters out of Big Fork, Montana, and Mofish Charters out of Lakeside, Montana. We have eight or nine boats available now on the lake on a daily basis. We have one of the largest charter boats in the Northwest, a boat that was custom made by uh, Thunder Jet back in the 90s and very well kept. We could take up to 15 people on that boat, John. So uh, no other boat like that on Flathead Lake. We can accommodate large groups. Uh, we can accommodate single anglers and everything in between. So pretty excited about that. Opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for us. Uh, we're anticipating doing 800 charter trips on Flathead Lake this year. Absolutely incredible. Folks, you're listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. We're talking to Mike Howe of House Fishing. He owns A. Able Charters and Mo Fish Charters. In addition to fishing Flathead Lake, I understand you now have a couple of guides that are working for you that are fishing another big lake in Montana, and this one's been on my bucket list to fish for a while. Tell our listeners a little bit about fishing at Fort Peck Reservoir, what you offer there. You bet, John. We are really excited about that. We have uh, entered a partnership with the Lake Ridge Lodging and Bait Shop over in the town of Fort Peck, right near the dam. And, you know, Fort Peck is probably the most underrated, underutilized fishery in the U.S., maybe even in North America. You know, we've got lake trout. We've got giant walleye northern pike, uh, smallmouth bass, catfish. And what's really got us excited is the Chinook salmon. Chinook were introduced in the Fort Peck Lake in the 80s, and in the last couple of years, this incredible Cisco forage base, these Chinook salmon are going well into the 20-pound range. It's just an incredible opportunity. July and August are the hottest months, but we really start targeting those fish in June. So we offer that. We've got... Uh, an incredible walleye, circuit champion walleye angler and Jason Mundell that's going to spend his summers over there on Fort Peck. If anybody wants to go catch a, a, a trophy walleye of a lifetime, Jason's the guy. Eddie Mint and his sons there at the Lake Ridge Resort are my salmon guys. Of course, they know everything about that lake. But uh, a trip to Fort Peck is absolutely should be on anybody's bucket list. The multi-species, multi-opportunity, there's always something biting on Fort Peck, and they're usually pretty darn big. You know, that's really interesting to me. I've always heard about the, the great walleye fishing, the pike fishing, and the bass fishing at Fort Peck. I'd never heard of this trophy Chinook fishery before. Is this kind of undiscovered territory for most folks outside of Montana? It really is. You know, the Missouri River system, as you drop down into the Dakotas, they've been playing with the Chinook salmon uh, hatcheries for quite, a, you know, quite some time now. Like I said, the mid-80s is when it began on Fort Peck. You know, water conditions, water levels, uh, an increasing forage base. Any of these sections of the Missouri where they're, where they're hatching and planting a Chinook are having really, really great success rates. Last year was probably one of the best years for Chinook salmon fishery. In fact, one of the anglers that I know here in Montana boated 56 Chinook salmon over 10 pounds last year. So, you know, it's very similar to the coastal Chinook fisheries. We use a lot of the same tackle. The only difference is, is these fish aren't natural spawners, but that's in July and August. They move back into the areas where they are released as juveniles and kind of do a fake spawn. But, you know, there are no proper spawning grounds for those fish there. So it's quite an incredible fishery and a, and a success story, very similar to the salmon fisheries on the Great Lake. So now, folks, in the middle part of the country... The Dakotas, Wyoming, you know, even back to uh, to Minnesota, you know, we've got another option now from the coastal fisheries or the Great Lakes fisheries right here in northeastern Montana. So we're really excited about that. We've got some uh, incredibly well-equipped boats. We're going to take good care of you. we got lodging, we've got comfortable boats, and we've got the guys that know how to put the fish in the net. 
Fascinating stuff. Mike, we've got to go. But, folks, your choice here. You can fish Flathead Lake in western Montana for lake trout or head over to northeast Montana. Go to Fort Peck Reservoir for Chinook salmon, pike, walleye, bass, catfish, and more. What's the website? What's the phone number we need to send people to, Mike? You bet, John. It's uh, aablefishing.com. So that's A-A-B-L-E fishing.com. Or our phone number is 406 257 5214. Folks can contact us directly through the website or just give us a call the old-fashioned way. That phone number again, 406-257-5214. That's 406-257-5214. Or go to aablefishing.com. That's aablefishing.com to fish with Mike Howe and his associate guides. Mike, thanks for sharing the update with us on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thank you, John. Always a pleasure. Rise above us, got a bamboo pole and a leaky boat. It ain't much, but if you bail, it'll float. I'm gonna take you fishing, honey. You're gonna love it. Backcountry hunters and anglers, the men and women working hard to keep public lands in public hands. Check us out at backcountryhunters.org. We're back with Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We're checking in with Nello Pacinich. He's the Executive Director for the Coastal Conservation Association in Washington State. And we thought that we'd catch up on some of the fishing news that's been going on. Nello, great to have you back on the show. Thank you, John. I appreciate the opportunity to be on. So, Nello, CCA is all about conservation of our fish and also, keeping our anglers in mind, let's start off with some news about a big win in Willapa Bay for the salmon. What's happened there? Well, John, there was a policy uh, that was put in place by the Washington Commission here a couple of years ago to uh, conserve the, the uh, Chinook uh, and, and uh, Coho runs in Willapa Bay. It was challenged by the Willapa Bay Gill Netters Association, and we are actually uh, had just kind of finished up round two of legal challenges. Their first challenge was relatively simple. They tried to... Uh, to get their case prosecuted down in the, the county where they're all at, as, as opposed to Thurston County. Uh, that was pretty minor. We, get, we got over that one relatively uh, quickly and easily. Uh, but the second one that they had, the lawsuit, they were challenging the department on a number of different things about their policy. I'm just going to hit on these just real quick. Uh, most of them were administrative. They, they said that uh, this policy looks too much like a rule. The department didn't have the authority improperly reduced the harvest rate on Chinook. They improperly used emergency regulations and uh, they failed to properly consider economic impacts. It was heard in court in, in the middle of middle of May and uh, so what the what the judge said on on these administrative ones is that uh, he didn't buy the claims. He says the department had the statute authority to do the uh, the policy. Uh, they thoroughly and well reasoned came up with uh, their reasons for reducing Chinook. They properly used the emergency regulations. Um, and here's the big one, John. And this one is pretty significant. So the the claim that WDFW failed to properly consider economic impacts. This is interesting, and the judge ruled that uh, they did, in fact, properly consider economic impacts, and it was dismissed on the grounds that conservation trumps economic consideration. So we just feel like this is a huge win in our legal system and will probably set a precedence moving forward in fisheries management. All right. Well, that is good news. Let's move on to sturgeon. As you know, and a lot of our listeners know, the spring Chinook run has been very, very slow to develop this year. We finally got some fish in the middle of May that were crossing over Bonneville Dam. But in light of the poor returns, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife opened up catch-and-keep sturgeon fisheries in the, the mid-slash-upper Columbia near basically from Vernita all the way up towards Crescent Bar. Uh, they also opened up a sturgeon fishery on Lake Roosevelt, and they were poised, it appears, to open up a sturgeon fishery on the lower Columbia River. But your organization said, hold on, let's slow down, let's get some public input. This angered some guides. Why did you do this? 
Yeah, John. So, yeah, good point. And I, I just, I just want to start out by saying that that, that officially CCA ha- uh, hasn't uh, taken a taken a position on this. We, we, but in all in all fairness, we have a lot of well educated members on this who uh, have have emailed, uh, contacted the commission, and asked, "Hey, what's going on here?" So, just a, just a couple of things. We haven't harvested sturgeon for three consecutive years now in the Lower River. For two of those last three years, staff from Oregon and Washington has actually gone to the commission and asked for a season. Uh, and at both times, the commission has said, no, we don't believe that there should be a season. So somehow, some way this time, the process was changed up a little bit. Uh, it didn't go through the normal channels, and I'm not sure why. As Also, as a side note, John, I have not actually seen a formal proposal on what a season structure would look like, how many days it would be, how many sturgeon would be harvested, and so forth and so on. I've heard enough through the grapevine uh, that I, you know, I think I got a feel for what it is, uh, but we have not seen anything official yet. And I, I think, uh, depending on what that looks like, there could be good arguments to have a retention fishery, and I'm sure there's uh, plenty of good arguments to not have a retention fishery. But we really got to get those details before we can really weigh in and make a decision. But uh, to your point, John, we we wanted to make sure that this was properly vetted. I think the states agreed with us. There was supposed to be a compact call. And to my dismay and surprise, actually, uh, it was canceled, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes before the call happened. And if I could, I'll just add one more thing. The the last report we got from, uh, at least in Washington, was in January at the commission meeting. We have provided a link to that uh, in an email blast we sent out, and I'll put it on our website here this afternoon. But uh, in that, the staff report did not recommend uh, moving forward with the retention season. Uh, they did say they would come back in March to the commission uh, with the additional information and they never did. Um, so what's interesting to me, John, is that nothing has changed that I know of as far as the health of the sturgeon population since January. Uh, and here we are, all, you know, all of a sudden, uh, 15 minutes before a compact call is supposed to happen and decide on the season and no details on it. So that was interesting. So here's a question for you. What has happened to the population on the lower Columbia? Are we talking about predation by sea lions primarily or is something else at work here? Well, yeah, boy, sea lion predation is a, is a significant issue on on the sturgeon. So, uh, by all indications, from the data that's being collected by Oregon and Washington, and I would add that on some of this data, John, there's about a 50% confidence interval. So, just to say that the data it somewhat means that there's a there's a lot of questions in the data, but. Uh, what has happened over the last three years uh, with no retention season, and by the way, we pushed for this no retention season three years ago and got pushed back from the same group of folks that are pushing back on our retention season now. But because of that, John, we now have a keeper population. So the I'll just call it you know the, the middle population, the teenagers, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, that has grown over the last three years. So there's more keeper sturgeon than there was three years ago. That's great. What we're most concerned about is the brood size sturgeon, so the ones, the spawners, the adults that are producing the young. There's some real questions there. Uh, there was a slight uptick in this year in the broodstock population in the adults. Uh, whether that is short-lived or a long-term trend, we don't know yet. Uh, but what we do know, and this is the most alarming thing, is that the juveniles, the babies, the, the smallest, the youngest population is not increasing. That number is going down, down, down. For a healthy population, uh, you want that number of babies to be around 90, 95%. We're hovering right now around 60% of the total population. So that is not a good indication for the long-term health of the population. Now, is there in- data to indicate if the season is done right and structured and slot limits are adjusted and so forth that you could maybe take a few fish out of that legal size class? I suppose you could make the case, yeah, for sure. And we would like to see harvest of sturgeon return to the way it, where it was in the 90s and 2000s when we were taking, you know, 30,000, 40,000 fish. That would be wonderful. Uh, but we got to address the sea lion predation. CCA is doing that. In Oregon and Washington, we're working with our federal delegates. And I'm just going to add, John, too, I think that it's time to really seriously consider sturgeon hatcheries on the, on the lower Columbia River to help jumpstart this juvenile production. Well, you heard it here first, a proposal to start sturgeon hatcheries on the lower Columbia from the Coastal Conservation Association. Nello, we've got to go. But, folks, if you want to find out more about this organization, I'm a member. I do believe in the work that they're doing. Go to their website, ccawashington.org. If you live in Oregon, it's ccaoregon.org. Check out the work they're doing. Check out some of the upcoming banquets they have as well. They've got some coming up in June and July in both of these states, and they've got Facebook 
pages two. It's simply CCA Washington or CCA Oregon. Nello, thanks for sharing all of this with us on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. You're welcome. Thank you, John. Want to go fishing and make money? You are in luck. This year's Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery kicks off May 1st. Just register at a check station and go fishing for 9-inch or longer northern pike minnow within designated waters of the Columbia or Snake River. Then you bring your fish back and collect a voucher good for a cash reward. The more fish you catch, the more they're worth. Five, six, and eight dollars per fish. Catch a pike minnow with a special tag and you've landed 500 bucks. Find out more at pikeminnow.org. That's pikeminnow.org. If you're after a really big game, it only makes sense to have the best scope you can put on your rifle. That's why you want the Loophole VX6 HD. This high-definition scope gives you sharpened clarity, and the Twilight Max Light Management System gives you the sight advantage you need at dawn and dusk when those big bucks, bulls, and bruins are on the move. Add on our lifetime gold ring guarantee, and you've got the rifle scope of your dreams. It's the Loophole VX6 HD. Look for it at a quality sporting goods store near you and at loophole.com. The road is calling you to experience one of Oregon's seven wonders, the Wallawas. So grab your family and spend some time exploring Northeast Oregon's Wallawa County. Visit the state park at the head of glacier-carved Wallawa Lake. Travel the Hell's Canyon Scenic Byway. Feel the pioneer spirit. Nez Perce history and see our western arts and bronzes. Ascend to the top of Mount Howard on the tram and you'll see why Wallawa County is one of Oregon's most scenic and adventurous vacation wonders. This summer, take the road that leads to wonders. It begins at WallawaCountyChamber.com. At Loophole Optics, they guarantee performance. Those other optics companies, they just warranty failure. That's why every Loophole product has a lifetime guarantee. Think of it as a warranty you'll never need to cash in on. Find out more at Loophole.com. Hi, I'm Craig Boddington. I've written about hunting for 40 years, much of it in bear country. I trust my life to bear spray because the research is in. It stopped bears 92% of the time and prevented injury 98% of the time. Bear spray requires less accuracy and won't harm your companions or the bear. Carry bear spray in bear country. Keep it accessible and practice. Sportsman's Warehouse is America's premier outfitter and has the quality gear you need for hunting, fishing, camping, and more. Our knowledgeable and friendly staff will help you find the right product so you get the most out of your time in the field or on the water. In addition to stocking superior clothing and outdoor equipment, we offer in-store events and seminars so you can enjoy a successful adventure. With over 70 stores located in the United States, it's easy to find a Sportsman's Warehouse store near you. Find out more at sportsmanswarehouse.com. One more time this week for Northwestern Outdoors Radio with John Cruz. We've got some upcoming events to tell you about taking place at Sportsman's Warehouse stores near you. And the biggest is a new store opening. It's happening in Everett on June 2nd on Everett Mall Parkway. There is going to be a lot of people there, but not as many as there will be for the grand opening on June 8th. Haven't gotten any press releases yet, but based on previous experience, you're going to want to be there early on the 8th because I suspect there's going to be some giveaways, some some prizes, and some great deals. Again, it is a brand new store opening up on Everett Mall Parkway in Everett, a brand new sportsman's warehouse. Heading to Gillette, Wyoming, there's two free classes for you on the 10th of June. You can learn all about fish finders, how to use them, and what's best for you at 10 a.m., and then stick around and learn how to bow fish at 1 p.m. It's a whole other way to go carp fishing. There's a youth introductory to archery class taking place at the Idaho Falls store, also on the 10th, this one from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's free for kids from ages 7 to 14. They'll be teaching the kids about safety and the fundamentals of using a compound bow. In Portland on the 10th, there's a gold panning seminar from 2 to 3 p.m. Come on down, try your hand at panning for gold. Claim Jumper Jones is going to be there to tell you everything you need to know about gold panning, sluicing, sniping, and metal detecting. And mark your calendar for June 17th in Bozeman, Montana, because... The National Wild Turkey Federation and Sportsman's Warehouse is going to be bringing you the annual Jake's Day at the East Gallatin Recreation Area. 
It's taking place from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The event's free to the public. Youth memberships are $10 each. With this membership, they'll receive a magazine four times a year. They'll be eligible for college scholarships, hunts of a lifetime, and other benefits. And now, it's time for your Sportsman's Warehouse Trivia Question of the Week. Do you remember that old song from Three Dog Night? Jeremiah was a bullfrog. We know he was a good friend of mine. But what we don't know is where he's from. Our question for you is pretty straightforward this week. Is Jeremiah, or for that matter, any other American bullfrog you call a friend, a native to the Northwest? Or is the bullfrog considered an invasive species? Let us know what you think. You can do so through our Facebook page. Just look for Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Like our page. Look for the post. Give us your answer there. Or if you prefer, go to our website at northwesternoutdoors.com. Go to our Contact Us page and answer the question. Is the American bullfrog native to the Northwest? Or does it come from another part of our country or the world? One lucky person who guesses right will win the $25 gift card we give away every week from Sportsman's Warehouse. We've got to go, but if you get a chance, tune into our show online through WRVO Radio. You'll find that internet station at RenoViolaOutdoors.com. Carries this show, our sister show, America Outdoors Radio, and a whole bunch of other outdoors programming. The website again, RenoViolaOutdoors.com. Summer is fast approaching, so until next time, take care, God bless, and make it a point to spend some time outdoors. Outdoors.